Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, you're all very, very welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kelly Fitzgerald. I'm the current uh, chair of the uh, IFOOT UCD uh, branch committee. Uh, and this, as you will see is uh, from our posters, is the inaugural lecture in terms of academic freedom. And we are delighted to be returning to these um, kind of areas of thought that over the past number of years, we've had to kind of hone in on what we're really focusing on and what we're doing. And it's really lovely to going back to business as, as usual, but let's not make it business as usual. And let's see if we can pick up a lot of those conversations that we were having uh, before the pandemic and bring us back. And I suppose something that hit me today as I sat through uh, revisions of academic council, um, academic regulations, which may seem very boring. It wasn't, Marie, it was stimulating. But what really struck me is that the first bullet point on our academic regulations is a spirit of inquiry. We are committed to ensuring freedom of expression and dialogue in a respectful and civil manner across the spectrum of views held by our varied and diverse student communities. And that's really coming at the core of what we are as a university and what we're doing here this evening. And we are delighted as this being our inaugural lecture to introduce uh, President-elect of UCD, Professor Orla Feely. Thank you very much, Kelly, for that introduction and also for the introduction to speak to you here briefly this evening as you launch your lecture series. And Kelly, you mentioned Academic Council and, of course, the event that you attended after that, which I also attended, was a wonderful event. That, that I, And I recommend this exhibition hugely to all of you, an exhibition over in UCD Special Collections on Seamus Heaney and the classics. It's based on a wonderful donation from a philanthropist and scholar called Joseph Hassett in Washington, D.C., a great friend of UCD. So we were launching the exhibition. We had the Heaney family there, Mary and her and Seamus's three children, and Roy Foster, uh, the great historian, spoke on Heaney. And, and that was a wonderful, wonderful uh, event and a wonderful talk to hear. And again, I was thinking on the way over how there is the thread that links what we were celebrating there and what we're celebrating here this evening of academic freedom, because academic freedom provides the foundations on which we stand, on which we do everything that we can do within a university system. So I think it is absolutely right and fitting and appropriate that IFOOT has taken this initiative with UCD School of Philosophy to, to launch a lecture series on the importance of the Dublin lectures on academic freedom, reminding us of the absolute importance of academic freedom to all that we do. This is intended to be an annual series, I know, and I'm delighted that it is being launched here within UCD this evening, and I wish you every success with it. Um, and the goal is to highlight the importance to the University of Academic Freedom, and I think reminding us that in the Universities Act, um, the we are charged with the right and responsibility not just to preserve, but also to promote academic freedom in the conduct of our internal and external affairs. And that is what is happening here. You are promoting the concept of academic freedom. And I am, again, completely supportive of that. The speaker then for the inaugural lecture of the series is Professor Terence Caron of the University of Lincoln. Very, very appropriate and, and, and outstanding choice of, of speaker for this inaugural lecture. Professor Caron produced the expert report on threats to academic freedom and autonomy of universities, which was commissioned by the Committee on Culture, Science, Education and Media. And the recommendations of Professor Caron's report were accepted by, by vote of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in November 2020. Professor Karen was also the author of the submission made by the UCU, the UK College and University Union, which took the UK government to task over its inadequate protection for academic freedom, in particular its lack of respect for the UNESCO 1997 recommendations of which the UK is a signatory state. This evening, Professor Karen will discuss the legal or de jure status of academic freedom here in Ireland. In his research, Professor Karen has found that academics in the UK have very poor knowledge of the legal protections associated with academic freedom. And he's found this also to be the case for academics here in Ireland and also more broadly across Europe. So this shows that academic freedom is not being promoted as it should be. It also permits neglect and even abuse of academic freedom, both intentional 
intentional and unintentional. So beginning with this evening's lecture and continuing with the annual lectures in this series, I hope that this situation can be rectified and that we in Ireland can lead in this area. We come out well when the European Universities Association does barometers of various aspects of university life. We in Ireland come out very poorly on financial autonomy of our universities, but we actually come out quite well on academic autonomy and academic freedom. So it'll be very interesting to see if that position is indeed merited, how we build on it and how we support it. So Professor Karen, thank you very much for joining us here this evening. I'm greatly looking forward to your talk. Delighted to welcome you here this evening. And Kelly, I'm going to hand back to you now. Thank you all. Thank you, Orla. And uh, as I said, uh, this has been on our, our minds for quite some time at, at committee level, at branch committee level for, for IFOOT. And again, we are just delighted that some of that inner working that's going on that sometimes doesn't seem as prevalent as our members would like to um, see it happening, we've really bringing it to the fore. And there are two members of our branch committee that I would really like to thank in this regard. And that, of course, is Lennon Onarni, our branch secretary, who is our technical support this evening. And of course, Dr. Tim Crawley from the School of Philosophy, who has really uh, spearheaded uh, this lecture happening this evening and our choice of speaker. And Tim is, is a fantastic colleague to have on the branch committee and really always uh, bringing us back to, to the, uh, to the core aspects of how we should be looking at things and, and, uh, uh well, well, I'll, I'll stop now, Tim, cause you're, 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 uh, getting a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> so, Tim, um, thank you so much for your work with the committee, and thank you so much for organizing this this evening, and it is my delight to hand over to you the proceedings for this night's inaugural lecture. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, many thanks to our new president, our incoming president, but practically our new president, um, it's really fantastic. Uh, it's almost like your first official function is to to launch this series. And I'm not sure, but we may have uh, some members of the press, or at least a student paper. Well, let me write your headline. Irish University President Endorses Academic Freedom Shocker. <laughs> now, there's, um, there's a remark I want to share with you as well. Uh, just under 90 years ago, 1932, uh, it's a remark made by the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Great University of Chicago to its legendary president, Robert Hutchins, a great defender of academic freedom. And he said, things are going pretty well at the university. There hasn't been anything in the papers for four days on the subject of academic freedom. <laughs> now this could hold well for UCD in recent times, especially under the previous administration of, of he who shall not be named. Um, of course, as it happens, there is a, a piece today in the, in the Irish Times on academic freedom. So President Feely's barely taken office and there's already uh, academic freedom in the newspapers. And I'm partly responsible for putting it there, practically fully responsible for setting it up. Uh, but on this occasion, the item in the newspaper is not thankfully highlighting a new case of academic freedom under threat, but rather it is about the importance of academic freedom and the importance, as President Feely said, of promoting it. And this is what this series of lectures aims to do. So it's a real honor to have Professor Terence Caron here to give the inaugural lecture. I first got to know Professor Caron when I downloaded the paper of his through ResearchGate. I downloaded his Academic Freedom in Europe, reviewing UNESCO's recommendations. Now, as anyone who uses ResearchGate or Academia Edu, you might be familiar with that little box that pops up and says, tell the author why you've downloaded his paper or her paper. And usually we just ignore it and say, no, no. But actually on this occasion I did, and I'm glad I did. I, I was just, it was already a, a generated sentence. So I just um, said, uh, interest in academic freedom. And Terence responded the very same day with uh, links to a whole other series of papers, which he said, these are much better than that one. Uh, and then noting I was from UCD, I guess it must've been in my uh, identity on ResearchGate. He, he said that he was gathering data and starting to look at academic freedom in Ireland. 
Now, you might ask why I'm in ancient philosophy. So why was I getting interested in papers on academic freedom to the extent of going to ResearchGate, uh, forgetting my password and finding it again, and then downloading papers? Well, perhaps the date of the communication with Professor Karen will give you a clue. Uh, it was the 25th of March, 2020. March, 2020. I wonder, does that ring a bell with anyone? Uh, March, 2020, spe specifically Friday, the 20th of March, 2020, is a date that should go down in infamy, really. It was the date of UCD's Dark Night of the Soul. It deserves almost to be remembered in the American fashion of 320. It was the date of one of the most cynical assaults on academic freedom ever seen in Ireland, certainly the most explicit and direct assault. This, of course, I'm referring to the draft addendum to the 2011 Statement of Academic Freedom, produced by the Academic Freedom Working Group, set up by the Academic Council Executive, chaired by Andrew Deeks. So this is what I actually wrote in my first uh, communication. Well, it was actually the second with Pro uh, Professor Karen on the 25th of March. I wrote, I've been concerned about academic freedom in my university for a while. I'd already actually corresponded with uh, President Deeks about academic freedom in 2017. So I've been concerned about academic freedom in my university for a while, but it increased this week when the administration shared a draft addendum to its 2011 statement on academic freedom, a truly appalling document that expresses a barefaced intention to curb academic freedom in order to facilitate international expansion. It refers to, quote, other traditions of academic freedom that we ought to, quote, learn about. Naturally, it doesn't make clear what a different tradition of academic freedom looks like, nor specify the country or countries where the, quote, European understanding of academic freedom might not be, quote, appropriate. All those quotes from the draft addendum. I concluded it's a cynical, sophistical statement. Now, it's not usual for me to bear my soul like that to someone I've just met online. But <laughs> Terence was immediately interested. He asked to see the document. And it's worth noting that his very first thought, his very first thought in the, on the 25th of March was, I assume IFOOT will issue a response. I think that's, that's significant. And it says something about IFOOT and its reputation, as Kelly was mentioning. Uh, we have uh, been fighting for academic freedom almost from its inception. So it's... It's nice to see that the first thought was that, will IFOOT issue a response? As we know now, of course, not only IFOOT, but very many academics responded to this draft addendum and the addendum which made national and international headlines was retracted. So a success for academic freedom, you might think? Yes, but a very qualified success because there have been other insidious attacks or threats to academic freedom, but they've been more hidden or implicit or invisible, and they haven't received any, any such response. Uh, just the, the issue seems to be this. I saw a recent statement about some new policy, an email about a new policy, and the line included was, I mean, you could say at least they mentioned it, but the line included was, this is not expected to impact upon academic freedom. Now, presumably they meant negatively. Um, but really, that's, that's not enough. That's, that's not sufficient. That academic freedom is not simply something that must be upheld or respected. It's not some, some VAR offside line that you draw across the pitch and you must strive to be just inside it. Maybe part of your shoulders outside, but the rest of your body is inside. No, it's something that must be promoted, as President Feely emphasized. The Universities Act 1997 is an exceptional document. It states that it is the right and responsibility I am repeating for President Feely, but it's worth repeating. It's the right and responsibility to preserve and promote academic freedom. Promote it. To quote Section 14, a university in performing its functions shall have the right and responsibility to preserve and promote the traditional principles of academic freedom in the conduct of its ex internal and external affairs. And if this is not insufficient, if this is insufficiently clear, excuse me, if this is insufficiently clear, the act continues. And if in the interpretation of this act, there is a doubt regarding the meaning of any provision, a construction that would promote that ethos and those traditions and principles shall be preferred to a construction that would not so promote. So it's not enough then to preserve academic freedom. It's not enough to say this won't impact on academic freedom. 
I'd love to say that. Every policy, every policy issued by the administration should have academic freedom and its promotion as a key aim. And when a policy does not, there should be some recourse to having that policy revised. Maybe we should have some kind of council of academic freedom officers who have a first look at every new draft of a policy and they accept or reject it on these principles. Does it preserve and promote academic freedom? We have a dignity and respect oversight group. Why not have an academic freedom oversight committee? In any case, this is how I began my relationship with Terence in the wake of the 320 March infamy. And so began countless emails back and forth exploring facets of academic freedom, what is and what is not a breach of academic freedom, and how it differs from free speech. I say exploring, but it was really me asking questions and Terence very patiently answering them. And then I would relay my answers, my newfound knowledge to my colleagues at IFOOT. They got to the point where another member of IFOOT actually referred to me as an expert in academic freedom. I corrected him. I'm not the expert. I just have access to the expert. And now we have the expert here. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Terence Kern. There'll be a short intermission while the technician does his job. Okay, I should like to start by thanking UCD and Tim and also IFOOT for inviting me here for what I hope will be an interesting and also stimulating seminar. However, unusually perhaps, my first slide has nothing to do with academic freedom whatsoever, but it is relevant to this and indeed every other presentation. Now here we see Satan interviewing a demon for a position in hell, and he's asking, I need someone well-versed in the art of torture. Do you know PowerPoint? And I fully appreciate there is a tendency to use PowerPoint a great deal, but students now expect it of us. The problem is that with academic freedom, it doesn't lend itself to kind of whiz-bang graphics or pictures anywhere at all. And that's a real problem. Um, moreover, in order to compress a huge amount of information, because it's quite a complex issue, um, I've got a fair number of slides. So as I say to all my students always, don't try and make notes. I will give you the slides and I'll do that anyway. So without further ado, let's move on to see exactly how this is gonna be structured. So firstly, we're gonna look at what exactly is academic freedom and then look at the UNESCO recommendation. UNESCO's recommendation has been pretty central to the development of academic freedom policies in Europe and elsewhere. Once we've done that, we're going to look at two attempts to measure academic freedom in terms of the de jure protection uh, and look at those with respect to Ireland before then looking at elements of the Higher Education Authority Act and what I think it does. Then we'll look at why academic freedom is important. I think it's worth saying this over and over again. And then finally, to ponder to some extent what is to be done within the Irish context, bearing in mind the EU legislation. So what is academic freedom? Now, as you can see on the screen there, both of them, academic freedom is often mentioned in supranational agreements. The two I put up here relates to Europe themselves, but there are others that are used elsewhere. So for example, in the USA, the American Association of University Professors has a declaration of principles, which is now so widely accepted across the USA that it constitutes a professional common or indeed a customary law. Academic freedom, it's worthwhile noting, is also mentioned in the UN Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, here we have two pieces of information about academic freedom from the Spanish and the Greek constitution. Within Europe, academic freedom is in fact mentioned in about half of the nation state's constitution, 
And those that do not mention academic freedom in the constitution more usually refer to it in a bespoke law that relates to academic freedom. So for example, in Austria, the University Organization Amendment Act indicates that, quotes, no member of a university may be required to participate in academic or artistic work which conflicts with his, her conscience. And that particular uh, phrase is quite unusual. There aren't many other places that actually look at that. So academic freedom itself. Academic freedom is related to the development of the university, it always has been from the very beginning. And universities themselves have been going a very long time. So you have Bologna, Padua, Paris, Oxford, all about the same time, 800 years. In addition, most universities have similar structures, faculties, schools, departments, and different, sorry, and similar practices, lectures, seminars, etc. Moreover, disputes over academic freedom, even between academics, have been going on for a very long time. In the past, there were always disputes with the monarchy and the church over academic freedom. And it's very surprising that despite the length of time that universities have existed, no agreement has yet been reached. However, it's worth pondering that academics may prefer it to be that way. Here we have some nice quotations. So academic freedom, like democracy, is ageless. It transcends time and is passed down from one generation to the next. I should be saying this in a Churchillian accent. You know, academic freedom is not a stable or a uniform concept, constantly shifting. I don't think it is, but still. And again, academic freedom rests on a variety of cultural and institutional factors and changes from time to time and from place to place. Uh, that's not strictly true, one way or another. So eulogies such as this are often used by academics to provide a defense for academic freedom, suggesting that it may be impossible to define it or even dangerous to actually try. Here we have quotation by Schmidt, and this is quite, I think, an important one. Not defining academic freedom has allowed academics to be vociferous about any complaints on the grounds that their academic freedom was being unjustly attacked. And the last quotation, David Rabin was in fact legal counsel for the American Association of University Professors. And he reports he often had to deal with ludicrous complaints like this, you know, they violated my academic freedom. I've only earned $99,000 this year. The United States academic freedom is protected indirectly through the constitution. That makes it very, very different. Having said that, Academic freedom itself is a freedom. That is, it is a liberty marked by the absence of restraints or threats against its exercise, rather than a right, which is an enforceable claim upon the assets of others. So academic freedom is often defined by a violation or an abridgment of a particular right. And it is, more particularly in the United States, often defined by its denial. In fact, in the United States, one specialist on academic freedom, Peter Byrne, graphically describes that lacking definition or guiding principle, the doctrine of academic freedom floats in law, picking up decisions as a hull does barnacles. And a further point worth making with respect to academic freedom in this particular way is that it has been related to Isaiah Berlin's distinction between negative freedom that is the absence of constraint, not being prevented from doing things, and positive freedom, that is the freedom and ability to act and be one's own master. And various studies, I remember one in uh, Sweden more particularly, have shown that over time there's been a shift away from positive freedom to negative freedom for academics. Here we have the definition from the AAUP, Teachers are entitled to full freedom in research and in the publication of the results. Teachers are entitled to freedom in the classroom and discussing their subject, but should be careful not to introduce items which are outside the subject into their lectures. So academic freedom relates to the freedom to create new knowledge by undertaking research and publishing the results, then disseminating this knowledge to students in the classroom, but with the overwhelming caveat 
of not introducing information which has no bearing on the topic itself. Here we have a definition by Finkin and Post, a very good definition. They argue that academic freedom extends, in fact, beyond the classroom. However, academic freedom for extramural speech, speaking outside of the university, is very much a disputed issue, more particularly in the United States. Some in the US would argue that academic freedom, it should extend beyond the classroom and be available both inside and outside the campus. By contrast, none of the countries in Europe have that particular view of extramural utterance itself. So if you look, for example, at legislation in Germany, France, et cetera, et cetera, the idea of having academic freedom outside the campus, extramural, just doesn't exist. Now, academic freedom is often considered to be a version of freedom of speech. And I put here, they're not the same. They are cousins, but not twins. So academic freedom is a narrow professional freedom granted to a few individuals, such as ourselves, within universities, who are selected for exceptional subject knowledge and professional competence, acting within the confines of the academic community to firstly, truthfully communicate peer validated factual statements and knowledgeable opinions on subjects in which they have accredited expertise to a group of students chosen to participate in university studies on the basis of academic criteria in order to educate them and also to undertake research to create new knowledge freely disseminated to their students and peer reviewed, critiqued and discussed by the wider academic community. Freedom of speech is different. It is a wide generic freedom granted to all, both individuals and organizations, to express their opinions and beliefs, which are neither peer reviewed nor necessarily true in any public environment, by whatever method they deem appropriate on any subject that they may choose to all other people, but for no particular purpose or explicit function. So such speech could, for example, be deliberately untrue and expressed for the purposes of either amusing the audience, as when, for example, a stand-up comedian fabricates a funny story, or provoking the audience as when a newspaper spreads false information. And I think that making the distinction between freedom of speech and academic freedom is very, very important in this debate. So we're now going to move on to look at the UNESCO 1997 recommendation. In November 1997, after over 30 years of struggle, and despite the fact that four countries still objected, all 182 members of UNESCO, including all the current EU members, signed the UNESCO recommendation on the status of higher education teaching personnel. And it actually states, and I put up here on the slide, the right to education, teaching and research can only be fully enjoyed in an atmosphere of academic freedom. The open communication of findings, hypotheses and opinions lies at the very heart of higher education. Interestingly enough, the United States did not sign up to the UNESCO recommendation. And the reason it didn't is because President Ronald Reagan had decided that UNESCO was a communist organization. And therefore he pulled it out of UNESCO and they did come back to UNESCO, but by then it was too late. So it was never signed off by the USA at all. Now, the actual statement, if you've read it, it's, it's quite lengthy, it's very detailed but it's not really particularly helpful as a day-to-day -day guide to assessing as to whether academic freedom has in fact been infringed. And also it doesn't actually set what the limits to academic freedom should be itself. It was actually drafted by two Canadian academics. Having said that, it is now viewed as being, I suppose, one of the primary recommendations on academic freedom. And it provides protection in five critical areas individual freedoms to teach and research, institutional autonomy, self-governance, and also tenure. So the first two are substantive elements of academic freedom, freedom to teach and research, and the other three are supportive. They enable academic freedom to flourish. Without the supportive elements, academic freedom would not really exist. 
And I've made, made a, a bit more of a point about this. In other words, the different elements of academic freedom are less individually important, although they are important, than the fact they all mesh together. Consequently, where one of the mutually supportive elements falters, the supportive elements, it undermines the other two and thereby weakens academic freedom for teaching and research. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, we have no tenure since 1988. Where tenure is lacking, academics may not be able to enjoy autonomy or participate in shared governance and make objective decisions on, for example, research priorities or teaching methods because they may lose their job. So it's not just one thing that's holding academic freedom together. It's these three things operating in tandem with each other. We now look at the first attempt to measure academic freedom, the de jure protection, with respect to Ireland. Now, this slide shows whether or not freedom of speech and expression is protected in the constitution of the EU states and whether elements of academic freedom are also protected in the constitution. Now, as you can see, as usual, it's the UK at the bottom with no plan. There's no protection whatsoever for freedom of expression in, in the UK. When we look at many of the nations, some of them provide protection for some elements of academic freedom in the constitution, although only nine explicitly specify both teaching and research. We can see that in seven states, which does include Ireland, freedom of speech and expression is protected in the constitution, but academic freedom is not. This slide shows the protection for freedom to teach and freedom for research provided by national legislation. So in those instances where academic freedom is not protected in the constitution, it will be protected in bespoke legislation. As you can see, most countries, including Ireland, do specify some legal protection for academic freedom. Uh, in Ireland, and Tim mentioned this, academic staff of a university shall have the freedom within the law in his or her teaching, research, and other activities either inside or outside the university. By contrast, places like Cyprus, Estonia, and Malta offer no legal protection for academic freedom. So what, what I tried to do was to test compliance with the different elements of the 1997 UNESCO recommendation. So I gathered information on institutional autonomy, academic freedom, in, institutional governance, and academic tenure. And it was quite difficult to try and assess this. And I ended up looking at each nation state for each element of academic freedom and working out as to whether that nation was in compliance, qualified compliance, or non-compliance with the UNESCO recommendation. And this shows, I can't see it very well, which I do apologize. This shows an example. So, if we move from the left, we've got here looking at Estonia. We ask the question, are the institutions legally autonomous? And as you can see, we've got a piece from the Estonian constitution that says they are. The next one looks at academic freedom protected in the constitution or in law. And we can see that the Czech Republic is compliant. The third column is about whether or not the academic staff can appear on elected bodies in decision making. As we can see here, Latvia. The law on higher education in Latvia allows this. And finally, with respect to academic tenure, we can see here that in Poland, it is the case that academic tenure occurs. So we looked at this from 27 different states, which was a major undertaking as much of the legislation, for example, wasn't in English in some of the countries. In addition, difficulties in trying to adjudge it meant that sometimes we were not as clear as we could be. However, we did make a good attempt to see to what extent different nation states were compliant. And when we asked the question, are the universities autonomous? Here you can see we put together the compliance and about, the, well, the majority are compliant. Cyprus is an aberrant case because half the island is controlled by Turkey. We can see that Ireland is definitely compliant. We move on then to look at protection in law. Again, we can see that many nations, including Ireland, are compliant in protecting academic freedom in legislation. The only state that's non-compliant is the United Kingdom. 
the 1988 Education Reform Act in the United Kingdom was designed to abolish tenure. And although it does provide some protection for academic freedom, that is only redress after academic freedom has been removed. So it is slightly different. Self-governance, we asked, is there self-governance? And here we can see Ireland was in qualified compliance. So not completely compliant. With respect to tenure, Although tenure has been scaled back across Europe and other, other nation states, most states still have some element of job security for academic staff. So for example, professors in Spain, catedraticos, they are classed as civil servants and employed directly, not by the university, but by the state. In the United Kingdom, tenure in the pre-1992 institutions was abolished by the Education Reform Act, and it had never existed in the politics anyway. So there is no protection whatever with respect to employment within the UK system. And here we can see, we have summarized those states that are high compliance. And as you can see there, quite happily, we've got Ireland compliant on three out of four and in qualified compliance. And Ireland's situation is the same as other nation states. So that would suggest that there is some degree of protection for academic freedom of Ireland. And here we have the low compliers. As we can see, again, we've got uh, the UK at the bottom. And above that, we've got Denmark. Now, what happened in Denmark was this report, this research was reported in the national press. The education minister was then asked difficult questions in the Danish parliament. Consequently, the Danish University Lecturers Professional Association put a case together before the Joint International Labour Organization, UNESCO Committee of Experts on the application of the recommendation concerning teaching personnel. In fact, the CIA did not find in favor of the Danish uh, Union, but because of the adverse publicity nationally, an externally appointed evaluation body was set up by the government. And this contained international experts. And they found, not surprisingly, that the act was repressive. And in 2011, following a general election, the law in Denmark was changed and better protection for academic freedom was given, which does suggest that making such appeals can have an effect. Now, the summary table shows that only about a third of the states are fully compliant with all aspects of UNESCO. But in the majority of states, there's either complete or qualified compliance with the majority of the elements of the UNESCO recommendation. It may be the case that some reasons for low compliance lie with the status of UNESCO itself. The UN Charter and Constitution of UNESCO established UNESCO's legal competence but the organization is prohibited from intervening in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of member states. Consequently, nations may ignore an element of the recommendation, for example, on grounds of employment security of academic staff, because they think that such matters relate directly to domestic jurisdiction and national, education, national economic policy. So they do have a let out, although they may have signed the thing, they may say, no, this is outside the jurisdiction of UNESCO itself, and we're going to ignore it. What we did at this stage was decided that we would award two points for full compliance, one point for qualified compliance, and then see if we could rank them. And we could see that there does seem to be at least something we can do insofar as we can get a mean value and a standard deviation. So that then led us to look at reappraising the research and trying to use better methods. And that brings us on to the second mode of analysis. <clears throat> so the first mode of analysis is very simple, very top down, but it doesn't address international agreements here. And more particularly, the method we used firstly was normative rather than criterion reference. What we then decided to do was to see if we could produce a criterion reference score that would enable us, for example, to see over time as to whether a country's standing 
with respect to academic freedom has improved or not. We then started to look at a bottom-up approach, trying to measure the protection for academic freedom to see if we can work out how it's altered over time. And this proved very difficult, but we finally came up with an academic freedom scorecard, 37 elements within it. Each of them relate to the major elements of the UNESCO recommendations. So freedom to teach, institutional autonomy, university governance, university autonomy, international agreements. We decided we'd make each of these worth 20%, one fifth. And we then set about gathering the information. Now here, I've got a list of the scorecard measures. These are the different measures that we use. So for example, if you look at number 21, it's the ability of the staff to appoint the rector. And 22 is the ability of staff to dismiss the rector. So for each one of these, 37 measures, we gathered information from 28 different nations. So we ended up with over a thousand observations that we looked at, which took, as you can imagine, a huge amount of time and effort. And these were viewed by two of us, and we reached some degree of some degree of agreement as to how we we're going to measure it. And here we can see the scorecard that was used to measure the right to academic freedom for Austria. It comes up with a total of 63.5%. So we've asked each of the individual questions. We then allocated so many points for that. We then added them up to come up with a final figure. And this shows exactly how we've done it. So one of the things we looked at was the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and also the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And as you can see, we agreed that each of these agreements was of equal importance and compliance was worth 1.5 marks. If we move down to the one below, we looked at the European Convention on Human Rights. We adopted a three-point scale, no points for non-compliance, and four marks for um, compliance. Sorry, I'm getting confused here. Failure to ratify was awarded no marks. And again here, this shows how constitutional provision on freedom of speech, on academic freedom was, was uh, actually scored. So full compliance, two marks, partial compliance, one mark, non-compliance, no marks. And we did this for every nation state for every one of the measures that we got. This one was particularly difficult. This looked at protection in higher education legislation for academic freedom. And as you can see, we had different scores, naught out of 10 for non-compliance, 2.5 out of 10 between partial and non-compliance, and we specify these, 5 out of 10 partial compliance, 7.5 between full and partial, and 10 out of 10 full compliance. So wherever possible, we tried to at least put together a rationale for the awarding of different scores as we went through it. And we did find that as time went on, Firstly, it got easier. And secondly, the degree of consensus between us also increased. Now on this slide, and the next one, this shows how the scores were put together for Ireland. And as you can see, the highlighted text in, in yellow, this all refers to the act. We went through the act and we cut and pasted relevant information where it was important with respect to determining as to whether academic freedom was protected. And you can see here that Ireland scored by this system 52.5%, which is not particularly high. This just shows the remainder of them. As you can see, this kind of work requires very close attention to the text of legal instruments. Having said that, there were occasions when we found it necessary to actually contact ministerial offices or even universities themselves for comment and assistance. So let's look at in international agreements and constitutional protection. This shows the scores for the EU. You can see the mean score is quite high, 15.6 out of 20. Ireland scores 11.5, which is quite low compared with the others, only just above the UK. Protection of academic freedom in HE legislation. Again, this shows the scores of European states. The mean score for this is 11.8. Ireland scores above the mean on this one. Protection of institutional autonomy. 
The mean value for this measure is below 10 out of 20. Having said that, both Ireland and the UK were among the high scoring nations. Um, I think you made the point that uh, the European Universities Association has done work on um, autonomy and normally Ireland comes out well. Self-governance, here we can see that the mean score is relatively low, 8.6. Ireland and the UK are among the lowest ranked. UK scored zero for academic self-governance. Tenure. The mean score for this measure is only 7.3. Tenured posts are now becoming increasingly rare across most European nations. Ireland scored above average, whereas the UK only scored very, very low, 5.5. So we put them all together and we end up with this grand table. And what was interesting was that there were no discernible patterns looking at it. So for example, we had expected that it may be the case that the Nor Nordic countries, Scandinavia, Finland, Norway, uh, Denmark, Sweden, would, would all be at the top, social democratic for a long time, very, very keen on academic freedom, didn't in fact work out like that at all. There doesn't appear to be any clear rationale for this, which suggests it's probably accurate, I'd like to think. I think that the Irish score, which is just below average, would benefit from further investigation. It will be useful to look at the de facto situation. It may be the de facto situation in Ireland is very good, which means that the de jure protection is not that necessary. I don't know. But it'd be worth at least looking at it. So what can we say in summary? No nation comes near to full compliance. You, you, EU states don't score very highly. There's great variation between them. The element with the lowest average score is tenure. The highest scoring element is in respect to international agreements. But having said that, most of these agreements were signed some years ago, and it may be the case that the de facto realities reveal that such obligations are being quietly ignored by government. And I'm now going to move on to look at the Higher Education Authority Act in Ireland. And I should say before I look at this that I have only made slight inroads into this. It's a huge document, the actual law itself, to go through. So these are my first observations with respect to it. The first thing is that governing bodies are going to be reduced in both their size and also their composition is going to be altered, which may reduce institutional autonomy and also individual participation in institutional governance. Um, it's very difficult to see how the aim that they've supposedly got, strategic development, actually squares with what they're doing in terms of governance. It just doesn't seem coherent. I try to summarize the new composition of the board. In essence, however, the board would have a larger proportion of external appointees and the possible dilution of internally elected representatives. There are going to be five internal members, but the government, governing bodies could allow internal members to be drawn only from the senior managers. And Tim made reference to the 1997 Act. If you compare the two, there is a huge difference between them. This legislation has definitely altered the possibility of academic freedom surviving and thriving. Timing. Mention is made about the strategy for tertiary education. Having said that, there was a national strategy for higher education to 2030 published in 2011. According to the Act, the Minister is going to prepare a strategy for provision of tertiary education. Surely the strategy should be completed before you alter the management system to implement it. Why would you do it this way around? There doesn't seem to be, again, any rationale with it. There seems to be a big gap between the intentions of the Act and the possible outcomes. And one of the things I did pick up is the Act supposedly is going to provide with better equity of access and participation. But there's no mention in the Act at all about how you might use ICTs and higher education to promote open and flexible learning. In fact, the use of such technologies is very, very important to some students 
who may, because of physical disabilities or caring responsibilities, be able to attend on campus. Moreover, having seen the way new artificial intelligence technologies can work in writing essays, they do a very good job. And clearly this is gonna pose severe challenges for universities in the future and for academic freedom itself. One of the functions of the bill is to promote student engagement, but nevertheless, the bill gives CEOs the right to nominate students to the board, thereby diminishing the role of students in participative decision-making. Again, there's no rationale for this. It seems to me that the act is based on what I've defined as ill-defined concepts and groundless assertions. So it refers to the need for good governance and allocates power to intervene. But it doesn't give any indication as to what good governance is or how its presence or absence could be measured. And I put down here the example from Oxford. The idea behind the reform in Ireland is that deliberative university boards are inefficient and too big. In Oxford, the congregation has over 5,000 members. An Oxford policy-making body has 26 members with only four external members. I don't think Oxford has any problems with respect to its position within the ranking. More importantly, if you look at some of what's been proposed in detail, it is evident that it contradicts the UNESCO recommendation. So the act is going to diminish the role of elected staff members and increase the input from external members. The UNESCO recommendation actually states that academics should have the right to elect a majority of representatives to academic bodies within the higher education institutions. And it does not look to me as though the new law will allow that. Again, the aim of the reform supposedly is to improve institutional governance and autonomy. Having said that, UNESCO made the point quite cleverly, autonomy should not be used by higher education institutions as a pretext to limit the rights of teaching personnel provided for in the recommendation. They'd already seen what might happen when universities cried for more autonomy and how that might affect academic freedom. So what I now let's look at is why academic freedom is important. I think it's worth restating this. Now, firstly, it's very, very important to academics. So, for example, Bertram Russell took three or four years to write Prin Principia Mathematica, but nevertheless, it had a huge effect on the growth of computing. Bertram Russell was twice removed from his academic post, once for his opposition to the First World War, and secondly, for his views on marriage. Similarly, if we look at someone like Crick and Watson, they developed ideas about DNA, despite the fact that Bragg, who was the head of the department, didn't want them to do it. And DNA has revolutionized not only medicine, but also, for example, um, profiling and forensic medicine. It's worth noting the location of new knowledge is by definition unknown, otherwise it wouldn't be new. So to try and manage the process of discovering where new knowledge is, is very, very difficult. And I put here, it's as easy as trying to manage the weather. We can forecast the weather, but we can't control it. If they want us to build a knowledge economy based on a larger amount of knowledge coming through, we require not less academic freedom, but more academic freedom. Trying to manage the process of knowledge discovery slows it down rather than speeding it up. Academic freedom is important to students. It is the case that if the syllabus and teaching methods are less challenging at one university than at others, then the degree from the first university may be worth less than the degree from the university with higher academic standards. Preliminary research has shown in Sweden at least that constraints on academic freedom may be a factor in falling teaching and student standards and an emphasis on safe rather than speculative or contentious research. So it's important to us. It's important to universities themselves. 
a study by um, Amanda Goodall of the vice chancellors of the top 100 universities found that those universities that had rectors who had lots and lots of publications tended to do to be higher ranked in journals and elsewhere. Some work I actually did on academic freedom and rankings demonstrated that those universities that best protect academic freedom also tend to have higher places in university rankings. Academic freedom, I think, is important to society as a whole. In New Zealand, this is actually recognized in law. The 1990 Education Amendment Act specifies that universities have, quote, the role of critic and conscience of society, unquote. And Fritz Matchlup, who's a great defender of academic freedom, has argued academic freedom is a right of the people, not a privilege of the few. And in that sense, academics using academic freedom should be able to keep governments to account. What I now like to do is to consider what may be done, bearing in mind what's happened in Ireland. Now, the first point to note is that academic freedom has been in retreat across the European Union. Um, for example, in Hungary, the Prime Minister of Hungary altered the law to try and get rid of, and finally did get rid of, the Central European University. In some nations I put here, the impact of the reforms has been mitigated. So in Finland, they wanted to alter the composition of the board. And it was found that this ran against the Finnish constitution and it was not allowed. In terms of strike action, I don't know what it's like here in Ireland, but in the UK, I note that strikes are often on a Wednesday because there's less teaching. Um, most academics do not like to go on strike at all. They really don't. Ireland's the signatory state of UNESCO's recommendation, so it would be possible to make an appeal to the CEART. Now, I put here, national governments can ignore appeals by professional associations and trade unions. They do, they have done. In the UK, the government ignored UCU for years and years, but they find it much more difficult just to ignore UNESCO. They can't do that. It's in the press and it frets badly on them. Since 2000, there have been three appeals, one from Australia, one from Denmark, and the UK one in 2019. The CERT itself is a strange body, 11 academics, one lay person, none from Ireland at present, and from, from the EU, but two from the UK. Submissions to the CERT have to be well-grounded in fact and not reliant on hearsay. And these submissions are public documents. In consequence, they reflect on the reputation, professionalism, and authority of the submitting institutions themselves. When I helped to write the, the submission by the Danish uh, union, it was not easy. It did not turn out very well. They had a very, very open way of doing it. The UCU submission, which I wrote, had a small team, but it was sent out to very many people before it was actually submitted to UNESCO. The national government has the right to respond to any submission made to UNESCO. So the audiences for an Irish submission will be both the CIT and also the national government who will come back. Regrettably, CIT moves at an incredibly slow pace. It only meets every three years. But once they've made a, a, a pronouncement, the government has to respond. It cannot ignore the findings. The UCU submission was a tangible demonstration to its members and the government of the UCU's resolve to address the issue of academic freedom. So it may be possible to actually do it. My final point takes the form, I suppose, of a question. And that is, if we as academics are unable or unwilling to fight for the freedom that has been bestowed upon us, what example are we giving to those whom we teach? Thank you. Thank you, Chris.